So today we are talking about the exciting topic, one of the most hotly anticipated topics of the OER universe, uh, which is metadata. Um, unfortunately, Laura Dawson, who's a uh, um, very experienced um, person in metadata, mainly from book publishing and database universe, um, who is going to talk generally about um, about things. Unfortunately, she's not available. So there will be three of us talking today. Um, so the topic is metadata. I'll do a quick introduction in a minute. But uh, first of all, welcome. As I think most of you guys know, this is the Office Hours, which is done in partnership between Rebus and the Open Textbook Network um, to talk about issues around open textbook publishing on a monthly basis. Um, and just very quickly, for those of you who don't know about Rebus, we are a nonprofit funded by the Hewlett Foundation. And we are developing um, a set of processes and tools to help publish open textbooks. And we work with universities and colleges and open textbook projects of various kinds um, and trying to build out a really collaborative approach so that we can scale up um, the publishing of open textbooks and help make it easier for people who are starting new programs or who already have programs to, but to support that process of publishing. So that's what we do. And Liz, maybe we'll um, put a link to the Rebus community in the chat um, so you can find us if you want to help um, other people get some open textbooks published. And I will turn over to Sarah to say hello and talk a bit about the Open Textbook Network. And then I will do a very quick intro to the topic we will chat about today. Hello, everybody. My name is Sarah Cohen. I'm the Managing Director at the Open Textbook Network. Really um, honored to get to do this work um, with uh, Rebus. And so glad that we're hosting another Office Hours together. Also happy to see a number of familiar names and faces here. Um, the Open Textbook Network, just briefly, is an alliance of close to 600 campuses um, across the United States working to support access, affordability, and student academic success through the use of open textbooks. We do that by supporting adoption, modification, and creation, um, and also work to develop sustainable programming for open education initiatives um, locally at institutions and with systems and consortia. Um, and so I'm going to put our link in there and happy to talk to anyone after the call um, if anyone would like to learn more. Um, the other thing that we do is maintain the Open Textbook Library, um, which I've also added the link there. Um, and we try to uh, create a one-stop shop for open textbooks um, for use anywhere by anyone. Um, and so um, we accept books from all over, not just OTN members, um, that are reviewed by faculty for faculty. Um, so again, happy to answer questions about that too, um, if anyone has them. And happy to be here and happy to see you all. Great. Thank you, Sarah. So I'm going to do my best to do a, a quick introduction to the topic, um, which is metadata. And I think that metadata... Um, is important. I think it becomes particularly important as we imagine a universe where more and more open textbooks are produced and particularly more and more textbooks available on the web. And so finding um, ways to discover that content, to understand what's in it, um, to understand maybe some other things about it, what license it has. Um, right now, how many textbooks are in the open textbook library, Sarah? Sorry, I muted oh, myself. Uh, <laughs> uh, around 425. 425. So we're still, you know, th this is in the scheme of what a lot of you librarians might have in your collections broadly. It's a pretty small number. Um, but we can imagine in a decade that that multiplies by 10 or more um, if we all do our jobs correctly. Um, so uh, finding content helping faculty find content, knowing what's in the content, knowing things about the content. This is the stuff that metadata does. And we have a pretty long tradition in the library world, in the book publishing world for this. Open textbooks have come out of a, a slightly different place. And, um, and I think that, that the, 
it's important that we think about these things as we think about scaling this up so that we don't just have a mess of content that no one can figure out what's in it. Um, so uh, that's roughly it. I, I think it's very important. It's also very important, especially in the web context, because um, there's a lot of stuff on the web and both in the library context and in the web context, they're slightly different, but um, it's, it's just critical that, that we get this right. It allows us to build a lot more on top of open textbooks if we do this right. And if we do it wrong, it causes everyone a lot of headaches. So I think that's about it for the introduction to the topic. Um, I'm going to turn over to uh, Naomi Eckenlob, who is the Eichenlob, who is the um, who is a catalog librarian. Is that correct? At Ryerson University in Toronto, um, and Ryerson has been doing a bunch of projects around open textbooks lately. And Naomi is part of that team, thinking particularly about metadata. So over to you, Naomi. Again, probably five or seven minutes to intro. Oh, and for those of you who don't know. Uh, we'll try to keep what we're talking about fairly tight, uh, just to around five minutes, and then we'll open it up and hopefully have a good um, discussion afterwards to ask questions and talk about things. So over to Naomi. Thank you very much, Hugh. Um, as you mentioned, I'm Naomi, and I'm a librarian at Ryerson University in Toronto, uh, which is yeah, in Toronto. Um, I recently worked on an OER project here at Ryerson along with um, one of my colleagues, Trina Grover, who's also in the audience today um, and is also a, a cataloger at Ryerson. Um, so I'm happy to be here today to share a little bit about our recent experiences um, because it was, it was new to um, both Trina and I to dive into um, the metadata world around OER specifically. Um, so Ryerson became involved in an OER project um, recently uh, that was an Ontario eCampus funded initiative and the project was to build a prototype open publishing infrastructure uh, that would integrate and extend the BC open textbook library um, and the content would be migrated from BC campus to eCampus Ontario. So this project began in earnest in May of this year um, and the project has a completion date of uh, tomorrow actually August 31st. So uh, there were four deliverables, and this is just to give you a little bit of context um, in our project, which were to, um, to create a working pressbook prototype with enhanced features, um, to, to integrate an open source repository, and that's where we came in, and I'll talk a bit more about that, um, community building and mobilization around OER, and then a learning module authoring and distribution prototyping. So Trina and I, um, along with our web services librarian, Sally Wilson, um, we're all part of the infrastructure work group, uh, which was responsible for the process of integrating the open source repository that would be storing the objects um, or that would support the open textbook platform and other content. Uh, so we were told that we would be storing the objects in D a DSpace repository. That was the open source um, solution that was selected. And we were asked to advise on metadata issues around access um, to the OER seed collection. And there was a view in addition to this to expanding content beyond just books. So again, this is a prototype um, project um, that, was, that is meant to, um, to provide access to OER, not just textbooks, but other OER as well. Um, so in terms of metadata, we looked at trends in learning object metadata and identified a couple of um, top, I would say, metadata schema contenders that we would uh, consider. And we wanted to keep in mind that we were focused on, of course, standardization, interoperability, and openness. So those were all very important to us. Um, and we set out with, you know, those priorities in mind. So we did consider um, schema.org's um, LRMI, Learning Resource Metadata Initiative, um, and OE, we looked also at OER Commons metadata application profile. Um, and we did start to do a little bit of work uh, mapping, for example, schema.org to Dublin Core. Um, Dublin Core was the, the default metadata schema that we were looking at um, because it was the default supported in DSpace. Um, and we also went as far as um, testing out registering our LRMI and the OER Commons um, metadata in our registering it in the DSpace metadata registry. Um, but at one point over the summer, we had a, a dedicated metadata meeting um, and most there were a numerous stakeholders involved. He was there um, with the development stakeholders and the search and discovery layer stakeholders of the project as well. 
um, and we had uh, some really good discussion about, you know, should, which schema should we move forward with. Um, and after much discussion, it was decided that um, because we did have really, really time, tight time constraints on this project, just a few months, um, and because this was just the first phase of a prototype project, uh, we decided that we would move forward with Dublin Core for now, um, even as it was the default metadata scheme in DSpace. So we knew that we were going to, uh, that meant that we would not have some, um, we would not have the educational components of the schema uh, during this first phase, but um, we decided that that in the, in the interest of moving forward and um, with our time constraints, that was the best, the best thing to do at the time. So, um, and also because we wanted to draw upon the expertise of the broader learning metadata community and work towards a common OER um, standard. So we wanted to make sure to put the time um, and resources into having the conversations that needed to be had um, and doing the work that needed to be worked to really, to, you know, really build a shared um, common open OER metadata schema that we would hopefully work towards in phase two. So as I said, um, discussions, lots of discussions and conversation, but we recommended that we start, um, we use Dublin Core as the single metadata schema in the first phase of our project. Um, and then we proposed building out an OER extension um, as a recommendation for phase two of this prototype project. Um, so down the road. So that we could include, of course, um, OER specific elements um, that we definitely want to have in our repository, especially for discoverability. So things like has, you know, has this object been reviewed, adopted, um, adapted, etc. So, and all of this, I just have to say, I'm just keeping a quick glance on time. I think I have about one more minute, Hugh. All of this um, reminds me of that Randall Monroe comic that um, you may or may not have seen about how standards proliferate. So there are 14 competing standards. Um, oh, 14, you say, well, that's ridiculous. But we do need to develop one universal standard that covers everyone's use cases. So now that's how we end up with 15 competing standards. Um, but I think just to quickly summarize um, some of the challenges for us in addition to, you know, selecting and just selecting our metadata schema um, is just thinking about the complexities of the different types of relationships between the objects. Um, in the OER repository, versions, adaptations, et cetera. Um, so we'll definitely have to give that more thought um, going forward and in our second phase. Um, and then we also had a hard time because this was a prototype sort of um, imagining and visualizing the various workflows, um, metadata workflows specifically. So, you know, what would be, um, what would be automatically generated, what metadata would be provided by authors, um, and what metadata may be mediated. So that was another challenge for us. And I'll just stop it there. Um, but I'm happy, of course, to pick up on any of these topics once we move for further into the discussion. Oh, Hugh, you're muted. Um, thank you, Naomi. Um, so again, we'll, uh, uh, so Sarah's gonna talk now about the Open Textbook Library. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what's going on at the W3C, because um, I think that's important as well. And, and then after that, we can open up and have, have discussions. And I did mention earlier that, um, uh, Melinda is here from uh, OER Commons. So she can, maybe we can invite Melinda as one of the first commenters to give just an overview of, of their approach to metadata. I know you, you guys were involved in the LRMI. Okay, so let's uh, start with Sarah. Um, Colin, over to you. Thank you. Um, and thanks so much, Naomi. That was super interesting. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to be in, in quite a bit of contrast to Naomi because I am not um, a cataloger. Um, and so I'm going to give a brief overview of kind of how the Open Textbook Network came to develop um, MARC records for um, the Open Textbook Library. A few things about the Open Textbook Library that you should know is that we are actually a referatory. We are not um, a, a repository. So the books in the Open Textbook Library are actually um, from all of the different campuses, universities, institutions that uh, create and provide access to this material. So we are not actually um, 
housing any of that material ourselves. And so that was a huge consideration when we were trying to figure out how are we going to provide um, increased access to the content. Um, we were very fortunate to start working with Colorado State University, um, I want to say almost three years ago now, on trying to develop um, metadata um, for the Open Textbook Library. Um, I do want to say that for us, um, open is perhaps the most important thing um, to, to everything about the Open Textbook Network. And so we were um, contacted by a number of vendors who offered to create metadata for us, but we did not feel comfortable getting involved with vendors to create any um, metadata around our around this content for fear that it would start to become proprietary and that's really not what we're trying to do. So that's when we turned to the network and asked a part um, for a, a network member to help us um, deal with this. We chose to make mark records um, primarily because we are an incredibly small team and we were using the benefit of a, of a campus. Um, we wanted anyone to be able to download this content um, or actually, sorry, records to this content um, from their library so that you could use it in your discovery layer, but for even smaller or more marginalized institutions, we wanted them to be able to have access to the content and every institution now is, um, you know, does, ha does have an OPAC. So we did want to do something that was really accessible for all types of institutions, including internationally. Um, and so we know that books from the Open Textbook Library are, are our records are being downloaded um, heavily across the United States and also through um, larger systems like, for example, the uh, Louisiana Library Network. Lewis has downloaded it through their entire system. Um, but we also know that it's used um, internationally throughout um, Asia, Africa, and South America. So we are trying to um, consider, that was a big consideration for us. Um, I did also just want to say um, that in terms of being a referatory, we also are facing those challenges of pointing to the right um, location for content. Um, and so the Open Textbook Library does maintain a dark archive so that if the links that were um, being included in our metadata um, should no longer be um, correct, that we'd be able to make that change. Um, we do provide a cumulative file of our MARC records that is updated um, we try to update that monthly. It also does include um, a um, removal list um, to be used. And we also rely on the community to let us know when things are not working. And so we've been contacted um, just last week with a record that was in duplicate. Um, and so we've you know, been working on trying to clean up those files with um, Colorado State as well as OCLC. Um, and so I think that that's actually all I'm going to say and wait for questions. Okay, awesome, Sarah, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna talk briefly about what's going on at the W3C, which I think has very important implications for um, open textbooks. Um, so W3C is a standards organization that sets the standards for the web. And there's a new initiative, um, and Rebus is a member of the working group developing this new standard uh, called Web Publications. And the idea is to build a, um, a web native standard for essentially a book on the web. And the reason we need that is the web has a notion of single addresses single URLs with a page attached to it, but there's no fundamental protocol or standard to say here is basically a unique item, let's say a book, and here are several different pages or chapters or resources associated with this book. So there's no kind of sense of at the protocol or standards level of a um, something that lives here at a URL and here are associated URLs with that. Um, so you basically can't build a TOC into any um, browser level applications in a way that's standardized. So um, 
at the W3C, there've been a lot of discussions about how, how to get this thing to work and, and kind of the key elements um, for getting a web publication, um, really the two key elements or a few others, but, but basically you need to have a place where it lives, a unique place, so a URL, um, and then what they're calling a manifest, which means what else is in this, what is at this URL, what are the other um, resources here, so essentially a table of contents. Um, there's some notion of, of defining a preferred reading order, um, so mimicking sort of a linear route through content, but with the notion that applications could be built that would um, allow you to navigate differently through content than, um, than perhaps a linear route. Um, and then the last, uh, another piece is metadata and how, um, how to represent metadata in uh, in these web publications. So we actually somehow or other, despite not having very much expertise in this, but maybe I was inspired by my meeting with Naomi and Trina uh, in Toronto, somehow we got saddled with the job of helping to write the specification uh, or the draft specification for the metadata piece of web publications. And, and the general approach we've taken is that there, um, there will be some very limited, so there will be actually no required metadata at all um, in a web publication. Um, but there would be recommended uh, metadata, which would be, um, so, so there's no must-haves. There are some recommended should-haves, which would be title, author, um, I think license information, there's a handful of other, other things uh, which are escaping me right now. I can share the draft with you guys afterwards. Um, and then finally, for extended metadata, the idea would be linking to a file that would be to whatever specification, metadata specification you care to choose. So whether it be Onyx, um, which is what the commercial publishers use, Mark Records, which is what uh, libraries mostly use, Dublin Core, which actually now I get lost in the details of how these things work. I think Mark is kind of an implementation of Dublin Core, if I'm not mistaken, or vice versa. Um, and then schema.org, for instance, which is the fundamental, uh, or sort of becoming the standard for websites, how they structure their metadata. So the idea again is that there is, this should be a very light specification, but allows you to have, for instance, you could have four different metadata files, one for each application. And I think in the world of open textbooks, where in a lot of cases they're web first, or hopefully we're going in that direction, uh, open textbooks are web first, but there may be EPUB files and PDF files, et cetera, associated with them as well. Um, the, the kind of general approach the W3C is taking is that um, there'd be a very limited amount of required metadata for a web version, and then you could have these other types of metadata files, which would be to a, a given specification. So we was trying to avoid the exact problem that Sarah mentioned of, of instead of saying, okay, what should be the web publication metadata specification, just use what already exists and, and uh, can find it all. So uh, again, the, what becomes exciting about this is this notion of what we could start to do if we had a really clear standard for what uh, open textbook looks like on the web and how the metadata is um, defined, how we expect the table of contents to be defined. And if we do that, it means we can start building new kinds of applications on top of, um, uh, of books on the web, new reading experiences, new different kinds of applications, and metadata obviously is a big part of that. Okay, so I think that's it. Um, I hope I didn't go on too long. Whoever's in charge of time, I guess that's me. Um, so I'm gonna wrap that up there, just say that the W3C work is kind of all in, in happening right now. I don't expect anything real to happen sort of, I suspect if it was in six months, I would be shocked, but the process is there and there's lots of good people and we seem to be moving in the right direction, in my opinion. Um, and I think open textbooks are going to be one of the first big use cases actually for this new specification, um, partly just because I'm involved and I'm pushing for that to happen, but also because the commercial publishers have constraints that open textbooks don't have on the web and that's, that's exciting. Okay. So I think that's it. Um, normally we have uh, taken questions in the chat, but I think our group were 27 people. So I think maybe uh, we should allow people to ask questions and, and have a more open discussion. Um, 
I think you all have to unmute yourself if you want to ask a question. Maybe type in the chat. Um, I'm not sure. Anyway, unmute yourselves if, if you'd like to ask a question. But before we do that, I, I wonder if I can just ask um, Melinda to talk a little bit about the OER Commons and, and what they're doing with metadata, because I know you guys did, have done an awful lot of work, including uh, the LRMI stuff. I, I know you guys were involved in that. So maybe you could just do a quick, just a, a two minute sort of overview maybe of what OER Commons is and what your approach to metadata has been. Melinda. Sure, I'd be happy to and um, invited our information services manager to join because she can speak better to our metadata strategy and work than I can. <laughs> um, but I am Mindy Boland. I'm a senior product manager of OER Commons. And um, in case you are not familiar with it, OER Commons is a digital public library of open education resources. We both host and um, link to of over 60,000 pieces of OER. Many of them are textbooks and um, we have over 10,000 registered users. So we do our best to make as much OER findable in the, in the world as we can. And uh, Michelle, why don't you uh, talk a little bit about where we have been and where we are with our metadata standards. Sure. So um, the OER Commons metadata schema uh, used IEE LOM sort of as uh, its first guiding um, uh, profile, uh, and that was way back before I joined ISTE. That was way back in 2007, I believe. Um, and since then, we've sort of taken an approach where we um, build different modules on top of that core. Um, that map to different metadata standards in the field. So, for example, on top of that, we have built extensions that map to LRMI metadata, um, that map to A11Y metadata, that map to, um, I'm trying to think, um, we did a bunch of work with NSDL to map metadata to NSDL DC and to LAR, for example. So the approach that we take is to have a, a core sort of internal metadata standard that can um, support all of these modules. And then when we push content out onto the web, for example, or into the learning registry or um, what have you, then we have data to whatever app the application that we're pushing to needs. So, You'll see, um, if you look at the OER Commons resources on uh, the web, that we're using schema.org and LRMI together there um, to provide metadata markup um, inside the page, or so it's, it's microdata markup. Uh, when we push resources to the learning registry, um, we're using the Go Open node now, so we're standardized to the, the LRMI schema that they're using. Um, and we also uh, can map from uh, OAI DC, NSDL DC, and, and LAR. So that's kind of a, an overview, is, is that we really try to be flexible and accommodate different standards in different contexts. So I hope that answers awesome. the question. Awesome. So I, I don't know, there's probably different um, levels of uh, metadata expertise on here. Um, uh, so, for instance, some of those acronyms, I think there was a note here um, uh, that there's a lot of acronyms there in, in metadata standards. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if it, it makes that much difference to know exactly what, what they are. I assume there's different sets of standards of, of metadata schemas. Maybe you could just quickly sort of broadly uh, respond to that, that, that um, uh, kind of the character of the different metadata standards and what's different between them. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, so A11Y uh, is accessibility metadata. Um, and that was, I'm not sure if it, I, I think it, it was similar to LRMI. So LRMI is specific to um, learning objects and it was an extension that was um, 
recently accepted to schema.org, which you mentioned is um, largely what folks are using on the web because that's what is used by the large search engines such as Google um, to sort of um, understand what's in a resource. Uh, so A11Y is similar to LRMI in that it's just focused on accessibility. Um, NSBLDC was uh, a metadata schema that was used by the National Science Digital Library, um, and that has elements of um, the of IEE LOM, which is learning object metadata, and I believe specifically for the web. Um, and NSBLDC does some. Um, interesting things where it combines um, some elements of um, the Open Archives Initiative, um, and that's the OAI DC standard. I'm sure most people are on this call are familiar with that. Um, Excellent. Okay, I think so. I would, um, I'll. Uh, Sort of summarize that to say that there are a lot of very specific metadata standards for very specific things, um, whether it be accessibility or specifics around learning objects. And, and this is, again, just part of the ecosystem that, that those of us particularly involved in publishing need to be aware of and, and thinking about um, how to make it easy either to capture that in the authoring process or to support it later when when OER ends up in repositories or whatever. Um, more questions. I think just maybe type uh, if you want to have a question in the chat, maybe, and then we'll or maybe just jump right in. I don't know. Maybe it'll be too chaos. Liz looks like you have a comment, Liz. Uh, I was just going to say it looks as though Eric has a question about versioning. Yes. Eric, can you uh, unmute and ask your question? Hey, everyone. Hi, Eric. Yeah, so uh, one of the things that I've been thinking about for a while and, and starting to try to do some stuff about is figuring out how to deal with versioning of open resources. One of the distinguishing characteristics of open books as opposed to traditional, you know, non-open books is that uh, uh, a lot of them um, can be modified by the user. So if a professor wants to replace a chapter of a book with his own chapter, or if you change the order of a course or uh, something like that, uh, there can be many versions of, of a particular textbook. And we see that happening a lot uh, for example, um, with some of the, uh, the, the, the open access textbooks that, uh, uh, that are going around and getting improved. And, and, and so I wonder what people are, especially the, the folks who have been working on cataloging, uh, uh, are doing about uh, cases where uh, books sort of morph in small ways, but ways that are important to users. Um, do we keep track of the, the family tree of the of the books, or do we uh, pretend that they're completely separate books with no relationship to each other? Uh, I'm just curious if if people have tried things and and run into problems and and or, or, or just close their eyes to, to, to the problem and, and, and not worry about it. Can I, can I hop in about how we're handling it in the Open Textbook Library? Please. Okay. Yes, please. So um, it's a really great question, Eric, and something that I think we ask ourselves all the time. Um, the way that we are at least addressing it in the Open Textbook Library is that we're essentially saying that we're maintaining kind of the, the document of record and we're assuming and we, we try to provide resources to support people who are going to, we're assuming people are going to make changes. We want people to make those changes, 
But that does not mean that we're going to collect all of the different versions and all of the different changes that get made. And so we're actually taking the view that that is um, up to people locally. However, if there is a significant enough change to the content of a book, then we essentially will, will examine with you to say, does this warrant it to be essentially a new book in and of itself? Mm -hmm. um, but those kinds of changes you describe in terms of, you know, moving, I mean, all the things we love about open, the ability to move things around, the ability to insert your own research, the ability to take things out. Um, those are all things that we think people can do locally and therefore can also store locally, provide access to locally. Um, I guess that doesn't answer it from a metadata perspective, but it does say like we are maintaining that kind of the mother record and the mother, the mother item um, and allowing people to download from there. And then whatever, again, because you have access to the MARC records, again, I'm taking a very library centric perspective here, but the ability to then make those changes within your own local metadata as need be, perhaps as a separate record or another, you know, with notes in your 500 fields or whatever that would look like. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, that's very helpful. Um, I was just wondering whether you are minting your own identifiers to keep track of what, what your conception of, of the work is. What a, what a great question that I actually cannot answer because I am, um, again, not a cataloger, but a question I'd be happy to pass on to the folks at Colorado State as well as our director of publishing and collections who couldn't be here today. Um, they yeah, would probably I, better know that answer. So I, I suspect there's no, um, I mean, we may have some strategies to deal with this now, but I don't think uh, other than sort of like the world of GitHub, which is a different universe where there's tracking of every minute change, um, talking about books and textbooks and sort of larger works in this context is a very new universe we're about to enter into. Um, I will say that um, uh, press books, so we have, we have a very big new feature that we're pushing out. Uh, by the way, for those who don't know, I do Rebus Community and I also do um, press books. Um, and part of the work with Ryerson that Naomi has also been part of uh, was to develop, formalize the process of clone, the ability to clone books from one press book instance to, to another easily. Um, so this is supporting the, the five R's of OER. And part of that was building in a formalized, very small, but a formalized, uneditable, and if you hack the software, you can edit it, but uneditable trace back to the original source content of the book. So the idea is that there should be a history of saying this book came from here, from here, from here, and here was the original one. Um, and that versioning, we haven't thought enough about it, but, but the kernel of how we think we might approach it is, is there. And that's something that we're hoping to be working on in the next number of months to try to get something that makes a bit of sense in that universe where it's very easy to take content from one place um, put it somewhere else and then modify it and have that be baked into the baked into that process of things moving from one place to another. Now that only would make sense if it was going from one press book instance to another. It's not the same if you're pulling out the EPUB and editing that or, or whatever. Um, there is a, a, a question here um, about, and maybe someone can answer this. So this is from C. Holland. I'm not sure uh, I don't know if you want to ask that out loud, C. Holland, um, or I can uh, read it out here. But the question is, um, when does something and when does a work, how much modification happens until you, it becomes a separate copyrightable work? Um, and who makes that decision? Is it the author? So that goes into licensing. And I don't know if there's anyone who's got some open licensing chops who would like to tackle that kind of complex question on the call here. <laughs> Anyone? So, as, as a copyright nerd, <laughs> uh, that's, um, you know, it depends a lot on, on, 
on how you are approaching uh, the intellectual property. So you have a lot of examples in open source software uh, where uh, in order to change the license, people have to get consent of, of you know, hundreds of authors. Um, and uh, so I, I don't think there's a really a, a concept of a separate copyrightable work when we're doing versioning. Uh, they are just derivative works. Um, so there's no hard line as to when when something, you know, is 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 so different from it's the work it's been derived of off of that it's no longer, you know, a derivative work but a new work. Um, but that's really complicated and and above my level of nerdery. I also and, say and, yeah, go ahead, Tara. I was just going. I'm uh, sorry. It took me a minute to scroll up to find the question um, in the chat. So sorry there. Um, I was just going to say that I think that one of the benefits of um, this is this is I think why there's such advocacy for creating open textbooks using CC BY um, and really trying to advocate for um, not only technical openness but also you know legal openness. And I think that. Um, this, this is exactly one of the struggles that we face in terms of trying to take works that are, um, you know, when, when there is more to it than just attribution, um, that, that we run into these, these harder questions that are not insurmountable, but I think um, raise a whole host of other issues. So I just wanted to say, I think this is a great reason for, um, the, you know, for CC BY, where it really is around, you know, here is the work that I'm basing this off of. And I think that there's great examples um, that, and a lot of guidance that Creative Commons has offered. Lumen has also done quite a bit of work in terms of, and OpenStax has done quite a bit of work in terms of how they attribute um, change within, within their material, um, especially, um, you know, when you go to sections or portions of material, how do you actually attribute that? Um, but I guess I would say that, um, you know, as long as you're, the, the, the question that Claudia, at least from how I'm, how I'm looking at it, is that the decision about, you know, is this a whole new work or is this some, um, just a derivative work, I think is a great question. But I think in CC BY, as long as you're giving that attribution, you're moving, you're, you're continuing to create that new material and that you as long as you're saying that it's coming from this other place, then you've done your job. Would anyone disagree think, with that? I know there's some so other I think, people on this call that have a I lot think, of oh. Amy, I'm not sure if, if you've got access to a mic to, to make your point there, but. Um, oh, I see, just, Amy. Oh, this, there you are, yeah. Can you hear me? Um, well, so I, I think about um, this same question less from a licensing perspective because um, it's a, what I'm thinking about is a derivative of an openly licensed book. So it's very clear that, you know, there is permission, et cetera. We know how to attribute it. Um, but just from a collection standpoint, you know, when someone lands, for example, on Open Oregon's Pressbooks page, um, is it useful for that person to see the different versions or, you know, it's sort of more along the lines it, at a very small scale of what Sarah was saying about the open textbook library collection. Um, you know, and how, how different should it be and how, how would a user know which version they want to explore, et cetera. Um, so it's, from that standpoint, not a licensing collection, but more like a, a management question. And one hopes this becomes a huge problem in our world, right? Like this is a sign that we're doing things right, that things are getting adapted and used in new context and improved for whatever particular context someone thinks they ought to be improved for. Um, and so I, I don't really have an answer, Amy, except to say it's like, it's clearly a, an issue and a problem. Um, but I think it's the one we hope happens probably more than most, most other problems, right? Like it's a, a sign that something's happening. I mean, that to me is a signal that of, of your success here in that book moving to somewhere else and getting used, but used in, in a way that, that meets someone else's requirements. And I think that's exactly what we want. Hi, Hugh. Um, this is Anita Walls from Virginia Tech. 
just wanted to add that there was a Twitter chat about this a little while back with the hashtag AskCC, in which some of the Creative Commons US people uh, responded to a lot of uh, similar questions that might be a good resource to look at. Yeah, uh, in general, just reflecting that back, Creative Commons is very deeply engaged in this, these sets of questions and are helpful, but uh, I think uh, it does get very complex very quickly. And I think that's an important thing that, you know, those of us thinking about this from a system point of view, how do we, how do we try to reduce the complexity for most people? And these questions about, you know, the, the, the fine. So there's a comment here um, by Jonathan um, about GitHub. And maybe I'll turn over to you in a second, Jonathan. But um, GitHub solves things at, at a technical level in a way that we could do here. Um, but in a lot of sense, the question we're asking here isn't so much technical as kind of uh, cultural and day-to-day -day use and and you know if you have 50 different versions of the same book and you search for that book and you find all 50 versions what do you do with that is that useful for anyone and how, how do we start thinking about handling that um, but these questions do get very complex and I think we're just gonna have to find sort of things that work well enough um, but maybe uh, Jonathan I don't know if you want to make uh, if you can come on the audio and and make some comments about GitHub and forks and commits and repositories. And you might be muted. Um, Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I, I no, I know, I, I just, I agree that there's a technical issue. It, it strikes me that, I mean, if you want to keep a complete um, sort of versioning tree, uh, th th this is a problem that has been well, discussed in the open source, I use the acronym FLOSS, Free Libre Open Source Software um, community for a long time. And things like GitHub or other kind of uh, versioning systems are, are, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like this, the, the, this is a, a problem. And I agree, it's a highly technical solution, but it seems like in terms of textbooks um, and the kind of the, that, you know, the, the differences between the versions may be significant for a particular user, and if a user cares enough to really explore, we want to make it discoverable if you do enough work. But if it's, if you just want to get a survey of what is available in a general area, then you don't need it to, del to dive deeply, deeply. So I think that the issue is somehow how to make it easier, you know, um, to make easy things easy and hard things possible to steal the line from the definition of Perl. But, um, you know, that, that uh, a lot of this has been done in places like GitHub and other flossy communities. And so I, I wonder if we can just steal some of that stuff. And um, I don't know, but that does a little bit off track from the metadata. I, mean, I think the metadata, the metadata, idea, metadata idea, I think helps then um, people who are crawling these kinds of resources to make them more easily searchable, findable. So I, I, I think the fine, good metadata and well-organized is is a key to help making easy things easy. Anyway. Yeah, I think the, so what we found is the, is the metaphor, like GitHub is the obvious metaphor to, to go to when thinking about open textbooks in when you first think about it. Translating that to reality is, is a little bit more difficult, it seems. Um, not sure why. So there's, I mean, uh, sorry, go ahead, Jonathan. Yeah. You know, if you want to make another metaphor, of course, there's always the, the Wikipedia page view of things, right? With yeah. Wikipedia, with the, if you look at the revision history of Wikipedia pages and the talk pages, it's, you know, and of course the, the, the common line about Wikipedia is that it, it, it's a complete failure in theory and it works wonderfully in practice. And, <laughs> and um, I don't think we know why. And if you want to, if you want our textbooks, it seems like, what we were saying about the open textbook library or maybe other people who are trying to have the most current version it should be uh, some sort of a canonical version should be recognized by the community that's sort of what we put the wikipedia talk pages are about making people make a collect make changes to some common resource and then there is the canonical current version um, yeah if you want to keep all possible versions but i as an instructor would like to see maybe I don't like the canonical version so much. I wish chapter two and three were switched in order and 
just to be able to see all of the forks and the kind of, I would like to be able to drill down to that kind of precision. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there's uh, a comment here from C. Holland um, saying, getting back to metadata, which is how do we know when to incorporate these authors, multitudes, there may be multitudes contributing to a work. Um, how do we know when to incorporate them into the metadata of a work? Um, I wonder if anyone can, can take that one. And if no one jumps in, I'll give my general opinion from a technical point of view. Again, this is the, the conflict that we're dealing with here. There's a technical problem and then sort of a real life problem. So from a technical point of view, you could have a million authors attached to uh, a book and there's no problem having that metadata from a digital uh, in a digital book um, or even in the you know 10 pages at the back of the list of people who've contributed um, what becomes more problematic is when we surface that and when do we want to see it and, and how do we want to see it I don't know if anyone else has any other comments on that question um, someone had a question about open stacks and how they track burgeoning. Um, I don't know if, I guess it was Jeremy had the question and maybe Anita has an answer. Um, so J Jeremy's question is, um, how does OpenStax track or link to derivatives of their works? And maybe Anita looks like you've got an answer to that. So. Hi Jeremy, I'm not sure that they do. There are various derivatives in, the, uh, in their cnx.org site where you can find lots of different ways that faculty have adapted these kinds of the OpenStax books. But then there are other places where they're simply hosted and they're the same. So BC Campus has a lot of their books, the EPUB version and all the other versions available, um, as well as uh, I believe that they have some of those in press books. So I don't know that they track derivatives. We could ask. Um, uh, Eric has a comment here um, talking about pushing metadata downstream with webhooks. So that sounds intriguing to me. Um, Eric, do you want to jump in and talk a bit about that? Well, it, it also relates to what Jonathan was talking about um, using GitHub. Um, I don't know if people are uh, uh, aware of what we've done with uh, the Gittenberg project where we uh, uh, put all of, uh, of uh, Project Gutenberg into GitHub, one, one book per repo. Um, and the idea was to make, make things open so that people could uh, make corrections and, and revisions. And um, so uh, with that, but, and, and we're working with Project Gutenberg to get, get them up to speed on, on moving all their, their, uh, their stuff to GitHub. So that, 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 that should be fun when it happens. Uh, but one thing we've done is um, we have uh, made it so that when you make a change in, in one of these GitHub repos, uh, the, there's a, a, a Travis process that goes and builds the eBooks. And uh, when that happens, uh, it uh, tickles a webhook on our on 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 Gluit, and then on Gluit will go and read the metadata file on GitHub that has been created as part of putting it on GitHub, and see okay, well, there's a new version number, or there's a, a you know we have to re-download uh, the the new files, and so it creates a, a an updated metadata record in Ungluit. And then when New York Public Library, uh, which has been uh, using our feed to, to, uh, to feed the ebooks into to Simply E, uh, they will read our modification date and, and re-download the books whenever there's a new modification date. So it's sort of, you know, it's not very extensive right now, but it at least, um, in this one chain, we've got it to work. Yeah, I think, uh, again, the, is one of the challenges is that if you sort of control the, 
um, the production place, then it becomes easier to, to manage thinking about this. Um, if you don't, if there's lots of things happening in different kinds of ecosystems, it makes it different, more difficult, which is why having standards around this makes it a bit easier. Yeah, I agree. Um, th there was a comment here from uh, Jeremy, which I think is actually maybe not such a crazy, uh, at first I disagree, but anyway, the comment is, how is this different than new editions of books? You know, when a library has 16 editions of book, of a book, each one gets a new metadata record and it's up to the user to determine which is the best for them. And I think the concern would be, well, there's going to be a thousand different versions of, of one textbook, but maybe that's not a real, maybe that's just an assumption that, that isn't borne out by reality. I well, mean, Amy, in it, yeah, go ahead, Sarah. No, I mean, and again, I'm not a cataloger, but I will say, like, I think that what's the challenge is that, and I think you're right, Hugh, that, you know, there could be a thousand versions in part because there is no longer that um, authoritative voice of who, who makes the decision of what is a new edition, right? So, I mean, that's where I think your point earlier, Hugh, about this is, this is still a new area and we are trying to figure out kind of what, what does it take for us to um, live with all of the potential and, and, and of openness and to be able to provide as much access as possible. And I think a question or attention, and again, I am not a cataloger, but attention there is, is access to every single possible version really in the best, like is that going to facilitate improved discovery and access? So I think that's a, that's, that's a challenge of working in the commons in that way. And that, that this, these kinds of conversations bore that out and allowed this kind of community to form to answer them. And that's really, I think, where both Rebus and the OTN love having these conversations and hearing these questions and bringing us all together around them. Yeah. So we're at three o'clock now. Um, so it seems like we could probably talk for a lot longer. Uh, metadata feels to me like one of the most, um, so kind of combining metadata and versioning, it's sort of a very fundamental building block to what we're doing here, but uh, very complex. So I think, as Sarah says, this is a conversation that we're going to keep having, having. And I think what our hope is, is that we can have these together so that we can try to, you know, as we're making decisions on the various projects we all work on, that we can try to um, have those converge rather than splitting off into 15 and 16 and 2000 new metadata um, formats or standards. Um, so I think we'll wrap it up. Uh, the video will be available. Um, thank you to Sarah and OTN. Uh, thanks to Liz, who's kind of the force of nature behind these office hours. Um, and maybe Sarah will let you do the final sign off. I have oh, no, your mute. The, nothing else to say except thank you. Thank you, Liz and Hugh. Thank you to all of you for coming. And uh, onwards we go together. Excellent. And uh, Mindy from, um, uh, from Open, uh, uh, no, I'm having a total blank. <laughs> oh, your uh, <laughs> oh, your comments. Thank you. Um, just because your email address is different and I, my <laughs> brain just went crunk. Um, so, OER Commons has probably done more thinking about, about big different collections of metadata and trying to standardize it than anyone else here, I think. Um, so definitely a good resource. And I think as we think about getting these conversations, maybe moving to more um, concrete directions that uh, we're certainly going to want to have, have you guys on board.